Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. Science fiction and fantasy are both infinitely more interesting than they already are. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello, and welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. On this episode, I'll be speaking with debut author Megan Morgan about her first book in her Sentinel Quartet series, The Altered Wake. We also discuss how her story differs from other sci-fi, what kinds of values she puts on her leading characters, and about her road to becoming a published author. So, without any further ado, let's begin. As long dormant superpowers awaken, a young woman faces a terrible dilemma. Betray her nation or hunt down her best friend? The future. Earth's governments have fallen, succeeded by a unified military order. An elite group of soldiers, the Sentinels, protect Kotarian from marauders and neighbors alike. Within, shadowy forces at the highest levels conspire for the power they need to enact a mysterious agenda. But now, something has changed. Men and women have emerged, displaying superhuman abilities, powerful enough to threaten the established order. And the High General Command Sentinel, Cameron Cardo, to track a superhuman gone rogue. A superhuman who holds the key to these powers' origin. Who happens to be Cardell's best friend. Who will reveal the truth to Cameron's own origins. The Altered, now wake. Get your copy of The Altered Wake, Book one of the Sentinel Quartet series by Megan Morgan at Amazon.com. All right, and I am here with the author, Megan Morgan. And Megan, how are you doing out there? I'm great. How are you doing? Pretty good. In your Sentinel Quartet series, you deal with a world that is run by a unified elite military order. What first inspired you to write a science fiction style world like this? Um, A lot of that came from, I had a lot of friends uh, who were in the army, um, and uh, I was married to a man in the military, and I was just really interested in in the culture and sort of the processes, and as a writer, you know, I'm I'm always sort of pulling things uh, that are happening in my own life into my work. And so it was a very natural thing for me to take these characters, you know, and and put them in that kind of life and to sort of be what, you know, the the consequences were of, you know, a military style government too. Yeah. And that actually kind of plays a lot in a lot of science fiction. Um, But you do something a little bit different in this, and we'll get to that in a moment. Now, your first book, The Altered Wake, sets the stage for the next book. Uh, People start to show signs of like superpowers and superhuman strength and and things like that. What types of superpowers do you use in this book? Um, There are there are several uh, varieties. One of the characters has like superhuman strength and like cat-like reflexes. Another uh, is a person who can convert energy uh, from one type to another and can sort of gather energy, almost like a human battery. And then uh, one person is uh, telepathic. Uh, another person has the ability to sort of help people heal. And, and there's another one that sort of comes in uh, later towards the end that, you know, is, is a bit of a spoiler. So I don't want to talk <laughs> about it too much. So now who are the main protagonists in your book? Um, the main characters are one uh, is, is Cameron Cardell. And uh, she's a member of the Kotarian Armed Forces. She's a sentinel. Um, and she's definitely the lead character over the course of the series and uh she is someone who's a little bit i think detached from the people around her emotionally um 
but she lives a very strict lifestyle and she's very, very good uh, at, at, at her job, at what she does, even though she has sort of a tendency to ignore the rules. Uh, mm. if it suits her to do so. Another character is uh, William Harfield, and uh, he is a scientist and a professor, and uh, he's, he's a total genius, but he's also very emotionally fragile. Um, mm. And that sort of dynamic, I, I always felt like it's something you don't see a lot, is this person who's very intelligent, um, and instead of being cool and detached, he, he's kind of volatile. He, he can be very happy and very angry. Um, and, and so that was always sort of an interesting dynamic to me. His uh, cousin is a man named Tristan. And he's sort of this uh, assassin who doesn't want to be. And, and he is very snarky about sort of the world around him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you include female lead characters in your writing. Do you find this to be like a trend in science fiction? Um, I think that, yeah, we're definitely seeing a lot of female characters in genres that it seems like we didn't used to see them a lot in. Um, I'm hopeful that trend isn't the word for it just because growing up as a kid, um, I loved Star Wars and mm. I loved Lord of the Rings and, and I loved those genres. And uh, as a little girl, I just so desperately wanted to see uh, more women in lead roles in those genres. So I, I love that we're seeing more and it's definitely a goal of mine to keep contributing more because I think that science fiction and fantasy are both um, infinitely more interesting than they already are when we see a, a mix of characters who reflect the real world. Yeah, and that's kind of like what science fiction does on a normal basis. And, you know, it's kind of funny yeah. how you talk about Star Wars because, I mean, Carrie Fisher, I mean, you know, she was an amazing actress. But in the role of Princess Leia, she really took the stage and, and, and showed this very powerful woman who was able to fight alongside with the rebels and really kind of stake her claim on this whole uh, mission. Um, and it was really amazing because, you know, even the newer movies that were created, she still kind of held her own. You know what I'm saying? People looked up yeah. to her. People uh, looked to her for inspiration. Um, so it, it is really interesting because when you look at women in literature, okay, and I'm not saying all literature, but I'm saying some literature, um, you'll, you'll see like this very submissive woman who has to wait for a man to come in and save her. And um, like when I saw uh, Wonder Woman, I was very surprised yeah. how they how they played that out. And I was actually surprised it took them so long to do a Wonder Woman movie um, just because it was yeah. like you have the perfect template right here to really make a statement, you know? So, yeah, it's, it's really cool that, that you're kind of adding that into your writing as well. And, I mean, you're, you're also a single mother. And how has that impacted your writing? Being a single mom who, you know, is also working, mm -hmm. um, I find that it's, it's actually caused me to value my writing so much more than I did before. Um, I know that my time is limited, um, and so I find it like I'm more compelled than ever to set aside time for it and make it a goal and a priority because, you know, this, this is what, uh, how I, I express myself best by far. And so for me to, to do that, um, even while raising two kids is just so vitally important. It's important for me personally, and it's also important for me to show them, you know, the value that I put on that, on getting my work out into the world. Because, you know, as my daughter and my son grow up, I, I would want them to value themselves mm -hmm. exactly that same way. I would want them to, you know, pursue their, their passion and to, to put their voice out into the world, whatever that means for them. Now, being a single mother and, and having kids, do you find that 
the the values that you have in your own heart kind of bleed into your story just to kind of give your kids some type of moral base? I mean, do you see that happening? Um, I would say th- that definitely, like, you know, I, I am constantly examining, you know, th- the world around me and asking why are things you know, this way and why are things that way and why do people do this kind of thing? And and definitely your priorities, you know, of course, change when you have kids. Mm-hmm. And and that always bleeds over, you know, in into my work for sure. Because when I write, it it's me, you know, speaking, mm-hmm. uh and, you know, everything that I think it definitely comes out onto the page. So, you know, anytime, anytime you have, you know, kids and they change your life that way, it impacts your work. Mm -hmm. Now you talked about star Wars. Okay. I'm a big star Wars fan. Yeah. I'm more of a star Trek fan, which is kind of sad, but anyway, (laughs) we can get to a whole nother star Wars, star Trek debate later. Um, (laughs) So now what, what kind of books or movies did you like when you were growing up? Um, I started actually, like, one of the first things that I read obsessively was Nancy Drew. Mm. I loved mystery novels as a kid. I also, especially in college, really fell in love with British literature. I love Jane Austen. And uh, as I've gotten older, like, Neil Gaiman and Stephen King have Mm. been huge influences of mine. And then also, of course, I mean, Harry Potter was... Mm like the thing that I read all through junior high and high school. Um, And uh, JK Rowling's ability to build a, an engaging and believable world and incredible characters in that world had an enormous impact on how I write. Yeah. And each one of them were so diverse. You know, it really does. Yeah. Like, I mean, you, you look at uh, Professor McGonagall and then Dumbledore, you know, they're completely different, diverse characters, both of them a leader in their own right. Now, this is the first book that you've published. Um, what have you learned so far from the publishing experience? Um, a lot of what I've learned is that there are so many different ways of publishing. And I think that there's not a one size fits all approach. And I definitely, especially through college and, you know, as a young adult, I had in my head, you know, well, I'm going to get an agent and my agent will get me a publisher. And then, you know, I'm, I'm going to go about it sort of the, the typical way. And uh, going through the actual process, I, I decided, you know, the that maybe wasn't right for me. And so I I kind of pulled back from finding an agent and went with self-publishing instead. And through that process, I ended up finding, you know, as I was getting the interior formatting done, uh, my publisher, uh, Clickworks. And it's not, it's not a, you know, full on publisher. It's a smaller indie hybrid, uh, (laughs) publishing. So so I'm still mostly an indie writer with a little bit of a boost um, mm. from someone who knows how to do certain parts of the stuff that I would rather not. So what I really learned is that it's just so important to put yourself out there um, and to, you know, sort of chase down all possible avenues and to find what works for you because the sort of standard template way of doing things might not be the way to go. Yeah. It is kind of funny. You know, it's like children, especially like who grew up, you know, let's just say a generation ago, they had this idea in their head. Um, I mean, you look at any book, uh, you look at the Goosebumps series. Okay. We, we kind of had this idea in our head that the only way we could become an author is if we went out, we got an agent, the agent went to a publisher, the publisher then published everything, and then you'd have all these things at, at Barnes & Noble. We even thought that Barnes & Noble was like the top of the ladder here. And it's like yeah. we're indoctrined with this concept. Same thing with, with people who go into music and into um, uh, theatrical arts. They find out that yeah. that 
doing some of these things on their own. I mean, I've seen some very, very good independent TV shows, some very good independent movies, and I realize, hey, you know what? These people are doing it on their own. They're going out and they're doing this without agents, without production crews, without any real major help, but they're producing things because they have a passion for it. And it seems to me like you're one of those same people. You have the passion for what you're doing. It doesn't matter what's in your way. You're going to, you're going to break open that door and get to where you need to go. And, and that's a good thing that that really shows your dedication to the art. Yes. And I was, I was really lucky. I think it was just, just exactly the right time um, I met an independent filmmaker uh, named Eric Christopher Myers, who has two movies out, Roulette and Butterfly Kisses. And his movies are, you know, professional. That They look like a movie that, you know, belongs in a movie theater. And he's an indie filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And he has done so much of it himself. And, uh, you know, I just happened to cross paths with him at just the right moment when I just needed to see, okay, I can see someone else who is doing that themselves. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, okay, well then I, I think that I can do that too. Yeah. It really makes sense. Now, speaking of movies, I mean, when you imagine a new book idea, do you kind of play it through your mind like a movie? Um, there are some, some scenes will come to me in sort of a cinematic, you know, (laughs) movie type fashion. I, I think that, a lot of times it's it's almost as much as i i live it as it is a movie uh and then there are other parts and these are sort of the connecting parts and these are the parts that you know as a writer you just have to sit down and make your way through them and let them come as they as they want to there are always those scenes in there that I can't picture until, you know, I start writing it. And then it's sometimes it's just building it, you know, piece by piece. Yeah. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Now, are you inspired by any way by like music that you listen to or do you listen to music when you write? Um, I, I do sometimes, uh, depending on, you know, what my mood is, uh, (laughs) listen to music, uh, while I was writing, uh, this particular book, um, I listened to a lot of Mumford and Sons Mm -hmm. and, uh, their music definitely influenced or, or at least sort of the the rhythms of their music would definitely sort of carry me through the process, uh, during times when maybe I didn't necessarily feel like, you know, getting down and and putting words on the page. (laughs) Now, you live a very busy lifestyle. We talked about how you're a single mom, you work. How did you manage to find time to write? Um, A lot of what it took for me was sort of, um, number one, eliminating distractions Mm. is a huge key. So, yeah, like deleting my Facebook app on my phone (laughs) and forcing myself off of Twitter and sort of realizing how much time I spend doing random things that aren't necessary. Um, Also, writing is something that even if I weren't an author, I would be doing it. Um, I love to to journal and I'm one of those people who I don't entirely know what I think sometimes until Mm -hmm. I write it down. Hmm. So to me, it's, it's a necessity. So even if I weren't writing novels, I would be writing something. Mm -hmm. Um, And then um, everyone is different, but a key component for me is sort of setting aside a block of time every day to do it. And sometimes that means getting up obscenely early. And and I'm not really a words per day kind of person so much as I am like an amount of time a Mm -hmm. day. And even if the, the mental trick that I have to play with myself to do that is to sort of acknowledge that even if it's just 10 minutes, that's something. Because I'm a perfectionist. I'm the kind of person who I'm like, if I can't get in a full 30 minutes or a full hour, then I I sometimes have a tendency to be like, okay, well, it doesn't matter. I'm just not going to bother. But sort of recognizing that even five or 10 minutes means getting something down and 
10 minutes today and 10 minutes tomorrow and 10 minutes the day after that, that adds up. Mm -hmm. So to me, sort of like recognizing how each little tiny piece of what I do is progress forward was that sort of revolutionized me as far as getting myself to the page, even when it seems like I don't have time. Yeah, and, and you mentioned that you kind of block a, a part of your day, you know, just a little bit of time just to kind of write. Do you ever find yourself not writing and just daydreaming about something that you mm-hmm. want to write? Um, usually, for me, like, my writing time is definitely the time when I get the words mm-hmm. on the paper. And it, every now and then, I'll, like, have to pause to, you know, struggle for a, a sentence or a way of phrasing something, but I spend a lot of time sort of thinking about things as I go about my day. Mm. So I usually find that when, yeah, I usually find that by the time I get to the paper, I I don't need to spend a ton of time thinking about it Mm -hmm. because there's usually something there. And even if there's (laughs) not, I just sort of like plow through it. (laughs) So it's just a, it's just a time for you to dump all this stuff out of your brain so you can actually work on it. That's, that's a good way to do it. Now, um, what, exactly. do you, <laughs> and what do you have planned for the next uh, Sentinel Quartet book? Um, the next book, you know, the first book in a series is always very much about establishing a world and characters and sort of what the, what the major conflict is going to be. Mm-hmm. And so I, the second book in the series, I think, delves a lot more deeply into the character's sort of personal uh, conflicts with what it is that's happening in in a more immediate and direct way. And I think that there are a lot of really critical decisions made in the second book and and, uh, massive shifts in sort of, you know, where the characters are and what kinds of lives they have um, as sort of the, the plot, you know, thickens. Yeah. And it really makes sense because you can do so much once you establish those characters in your first book, once you start branching off into their individual lives or motivations or, or their own personal conflicts and, and other stories, you can really branch this thing off. Do you have like a a set goal of how many books you want to produce with this series? Um, right now it's four is, Mm. is where I'm at. And that's just sort of, you know, I I have a general idea of where, you know, the plot is going to go towards the end. And I'm sure that will shift and change as I write. Mm -hmm. But uh, as I looked at the material that I have, you know, in in mind, uh, I estimated, you know, where I was going to end up. And and four seemed like about what I would need to, you know, cover the story that I have. Mm -hmm. That's good. Now, you're a new author, okay, but you have completed your first book. And actually, I've been kind of watching your progress on Twitter and seeing that you were kind of getting involved in this. And it was kind of exciting, you know. Um, That being said, um, what would you give as far as advice to an author who's just starting out? They may be that same person that was posting things on Twitter about how they're working on their uh, work in progress. What advice would you give somebody who's doing that? Um, Like... I think the biggest advice that I can give to someone is if you have something that you're writing from an honest place, then don't be afraid to get it out there. Don't feel like you need, you know, certain tools in order to move forward. And and, and the main thing is, you know, always, always write, I think, from a, a, a place of honesty. They say, you know, write what you know. And to me, that's what that means. Is mm. Even if you're writing, you know, science fiction and fantasy and, you know, these things that sort of deal in worlds that don't exist and therefore you can't 100% know. If you're writing from a place, if, if you're telling a story that is true mentally or emotionally, um then then I think you're on the right track. And then don't don't be afraid to, you know, get out there and get it in front of people. It's 
such an intimidating thing, I think, sometimes doing the sort of the, the hustling and the talking to people and asking people for favors and asking people. I had to talk to several people to, to get the cover done. Um, and, and I think that sometimes as a lot of writers that I know, that's very scary to, you know, have to go to people and ask them about that kind of thing. Just like, even, even if you are afraid, you have to go do it because you have to get, you know, your story out there. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And now people can find your book on Amazon.com, um, The Altered Wake, uh, the uh, Sentinel Quartet, first book of the series, and... Um, I, I just want to thank you so much for being here on the show. It was really nice to talk to somebody who really has a passion for what they're doing and uh, doesn't mind, you know, getting those people together and say, hey, you know, I need a book cover. Hey, I want you to look at this and edit this. Hey, I'm, I'm going to do whatever I can to become that person that I've always wanted to be. So I want to congratulate you for, for getting this debut book started. And I, I look forward to seeing what you have to do in the future. I mean, it's, it's going to be amazing. Well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I really appreciate I love talking about this stuff. So <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you so much. <laughs> and check out Megan Morgan on Amazon.com. This is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. Science fiction and fantasy are both infinitely more interesting than they already are. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. 